Welcome to You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker, a podcast to encourage and equip moms along their parenting journey. Join Sarah each week as she interviews dads and moms like you and discusses the joys, challenges, and rewards of raising kids. Hi, and welcome to this week's You've Got This. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I am so glad you joined me. Today, I am very excited to have with me Eva Klein. She is a mother of three, a recovering lawyer, and a certified infant and child sleep consultant. And she's also the owner and founder of My Sleeping Baby and the Sleep Bible Program. We're going to talk about kind of toddler preschool sleep, but I'm sure a lot of these are going to be able to apply to older kids. But even I were just talking before we started recording about how crazy parents kind of get about sleep, right? You always hear, well, I'll sleep when they're 18. (laughs) Isn't that the truth? (laughs) why Why are we so crazy about and worried about our kids and sleep? Sleep deprivation is torturous. It really is. I mean, it's used as a form of torture for a reason. And when we aren't sleeping well, we're not at our best. We can't be at our best. And so as humans, when we have other extenuating circumstances, people keeping us up at night, it's only natural for us to go into survival mode and think, okay, how can I survive this? And and then hopefully from there, How can I fix this so that this problem is no longer ongoing and so that we can have a proper solution here? Right. And, you know, so many, we kind of expect it with our babies, right? I mean, you know, they can't sleep through the night because, hey, they were just born and they need food and changing and comforting and all that kind of stuff. So we're usually not, we're usually okay with that. I think. Right. Right. I mean, the newborn stage is known for, you know, a little bit of sleep deprivation because you have a newborn baby that just nutritively needs to be eating around the clock. But the good news is that once your baby graduates that newborn phase and reaches infancy by infancy, by let's say four or five, six months, you don't need to be looking at, you know, multiple night wakings, maybe once, you know, maybe, maybe twice. And then definitely by the time they're a toddler, I would argue that not only can they be sleeping through the night on a regular basis, but they need that uninterrupted sleep just as much as you do. Right. I know. And I think that for so many parents, they just, they don't quite understand that. I remember when I think my first, I have four children, um, as my listeners know. And I think when my first was, I don't know, I guess she was probably a toddler somewhere in there. I was at a birthday party. You know, the little toddlers were all running around trying not to kill each other. And one of the moms said, you know, she kind of was talking about sleep or something. She goes, well, you know, she was kind of like, uh, you know, what, when does Naomi go to sleep? And I think at that time, you know, she, she was under two-ish. And I said, oh, yeah, she's in bed by 6.30-ish, you know, between 6.30 and 7 every night. And she just kind of looked at me like, well, what? What yeah, planet are yeah, you yeah, on? Yeah, what planet are you on? And how do you, she has her child, you know, she's like, she just won't go to, she won't go to sleep. I'm like, what's won't about it? I'm like, here's your right. bed. Here's the light off. Good night. What's the other option? <laughs> yes. I mean, what's yet right? And it was just, that's when I kind of realized that I don't know how she dealt with her cranky child all day, you know, because if mine didn't get sleep, oh my goodness. I know if I don't get enough sleep, I'm, you know, tired and You're cranky. Cr- 100%, yes. <laughs> as am I. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a scary person to be around, hence why I got into this business, right. thanks, thanks to my middle child. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to forget that toddlers are, they're little humans, right? They're, they're mini humans, just like you and I with similar needs. You know, they need sleep, they need food, they need activity. And when they don't get the sleep that they need, they're not able to function at 100%. They're not able to take in the world around them and learn and really be able to thrive the way that we want them to be. So jumping in and making changes, first of all, at this age is 100% doable. I cannot emphasize this enough. I think that so many parents are afraid 
to make changes to their toddler's sleep habits because they think that it's impossible, that they think that they miss the boat, that their child is too old. And I want to go on record here by (laughs) saying (laughs) that that is 100% not the case. And I can say this confidently, having worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families with toddlers and preschoolers, ages two, three, four, and five, who with the right plan in place and with enough consistency have been able to get ourselves a champion sleeper and no, it's not going to be easy and no, it's not going to be as straightforward as let's say making changes with an infant's sleep habits because Hey, it's a toddler, right? right? Toddlers know how to, toddlers know how to t- throw a temper tantrum, not unlike babies. And so it might take a little bit longer and it might be a little bit more exhausting, but this is the kind of thing that can absolutely be fixed and probably should be fixed. If you're thinking to yourself, gosh, this is a problem. I'm not happy with the status quo. And look, it's one thing I don't go around preaching to people, telling people what they need to be doing, because if your scenario is working for you, then who am I to tell you to change that? But that's not that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to families who are bloody exhausted, who are feeling overwhelmed because they don't have an evening. They're spending who knows how long getting their, you know, lying next to their little one or rocking their little one to sleep. They're still waking up at night. So they haven't had a proper night's sleep in years. And maybe they're waking up at the crack of dawn. Maybe their toddler is up for these extended periods of time at night, or they're just waking up so many times and they're exhausted and they're overwhelmed and they don't have time to take care of themselves and they don't have time to spend time with their their, their partners and they, they don't have time to exercise and, and make themselves, you know, healthy food and they're waking up feeling like garbage every morning, but they don't think that this is something that can be fixed. I want to assure everybody listening here that this absolutely can be fixed and it doesn't need to take very long either. Maybe a few weeks. Right. And I think that, you know, at the bottom of this is the fact that toddlers, preschoolers, young elementary school kids and all the way up into my, you know, teenage, I have two teenagers now, they all need their sleep. I mean, they're, they need, Absolutely. and they need more sleep than I think we do. I mean, so, yes. you know, I mean, toddlers need like what, 12 hours of sleep a night? Yeah, I mean, depending on the age, a two-year-old needs ballpark 13 hours over a 24-hour period um, because most two-year-olds are still napping. Right. So they might be napping two hours during the day and then sleeping 11 hours uninterrupted at night. That's about the average. And then by the time the child turns three, again, the average, you know, the average is about 12 hours of sleep over a 24-hour period. So that might mean 11 hours of sleep at night with a one-hour nap or 12 hours of uninterrupted sleep. And then it doesn't really go down significantly when the child is four or five, I would say. Right. And I think that when you look at that, that means that if your child is no longer taking a nap, they need to be in bed at around seven at night. Absolutely. Maybe even earlier if they're just if they just recently dropped their nap and they're incredibly exhausted from not sleeping at all during the day. Sometimes, I mean, I was putting my kids to bed for six or six thirty when they went through that stage. Oh yeah, me you you and me both. And I remember when <laughs> another mom was like, "Well, that, you know, because you know, I I was you know able to stay home with my kids. It was a choice my husband and I made. So they were like, "Well, your husband doesn't see the kids." I said, "Yeah, he doesn't." I said. But it's better that he doesn't than to have tired and cranky and a horrible time with him seeing the kids. Right. And this is, and you know, the thing is, is that again, I think this goes back to you that we can make changes in their sleep habits. This is temporary as this is just like two or three months at the most as the child adjusts to not having that nap and then they're going to bed seven ish or so. Absolutely. Or the other thing to remember is that there's always the morning. Yes. You know, usually (laughs) if the child's going to bed at six or six thirty, they're likely not sleeping in until eight the next day. They're likely going to be up at, let's say, six thirty if they're sleeping around the clock. And assuming dad is at home, why can't dad spend some quality time with the child at six thirty in the morning? You know, while you mosey your way out of bed, you know, at your like calm, leisurely pace and, you know, and let dad have some quality time with the kids. That's I 
I think what we also forget that spending quality time with your child doesn't have to happen after work. It can happen before work too. Yeah. And I love that because that's something that we did. You know, my husband would get the kid up at six, six thirty, you know, and I yeah. got to sleep a little bit longer, but he had that time with the child that he didn't see at the back end of the day. And frankly, the child was much happier in the morning <laughs> than sure. the child or- was, would have been at the end of the day. So it wasn't, so the, the time together was not just, you know, they had that time together, but it was also, I think, a more positive interaction because he wasn't dealing with a tired and cranky toddler. Absolutely. The other thing I think we forget is that we don't have to put our child to bed and have them fall asleep you know, within like five seconds. We always think, Mm -hmm. don't we always think that though? Oh, you know, if the child fusses for a little bit or, you know, we forget that having that ability to kind of self-soothe themselves to sleep is, I mean, that's a, that's an important kind of skill that kids need, right? It's a skill that they'll take with them throughout their lives. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but nobody's rubbing my back until I fall asleep every day. <laughs> I you wish, know? right? <laughs> I, I gotta do that. That sounds great. But at the end of the day, like, I gotta do all that work by myself. And that's just what I'm used to doing. And that's what you're used to doing. And without that skill set, it's not gonna necessarily mean that your child outgrows it. It could very well, it often does, just end up developing into an old older, more mature version of the toddler problem that people were having. I mean, there's a lot of elementary school age children that have a lot of trouble falling asleep because they just never really learned how to do so without tons of assistance when they were younger. But I want to assure everybody that this can be taught. And yes, if your toddler is used to you, for example, rocking her to sleep, and then instead of rocking her to sleep, you place her in the crib and you have her fall asleep by herself. First of all, you don't just have to put her in the crib and say goodnight and leave and let her scream. That's not something that you have to do. You can absolutely (laughs) use approaches that are more supportive and more gradual, but at the same time, Time are firm enough in terms of the, the new boundaries that you're introducing that you'll actually get real results. And yes, you're going to get pushback because this is different than what the child is used to, right? Kids throw temper tantrums. That's just what they do when they're not getting what they want. But I think it's important to differentiate between what a child wants versus what a child needs. And you see, we as adults with critical thinking skills understand that. Two-year-olds don't have critical thinking skills, and they're not going to have that skill set for quite a while. And so they don't understand the difference between good change and bad change. And so when we are introducing good change, like, hey, we're going to teach you how to fall asleep without mommy's help so that you can fall asleep more quickly and so that you can learn how to sleep throughout the night. They don't. And so that you can be happier the next morning. They don't understand that. No. And they're not going to understand understand that for a very long time. And so we can't expect that your child is just going to adjust to these changes, you know, fully content. Um, They're not. But you can still be there supporting them while they go through this learning process. And then you, of course, are the adult that understands this is for the best. This is going to majorly benefit my entire family unit and each individual in the entire family unit. And this is a process that will take me just a few weeks to get through. And then everyone is going to be much happier in the end. And I think that's just what you have to tell yourself. Right. And I, and I, that's so true. And I think also we don't realize how we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot by prolonging some of these, you know, nighttime, you know, not allowing our children to learn to fall asleep on our, on their own by helping them with all of these aids, right? Yes. I mean, and cause be, because we don't like that pushback. Right. Well, because, oh, but she's going to cry. Yes. You know, she's going to scream. And, you know, my response is, yeah, yeah, you're right. 
she's absolutely going to cry and scream. And it's going to have to get worse in order for it to get better. And I think that that's what, you know, scares a lot of families because they're going, oh my God, things are already so bad. And I think people need a lot of reassurance that if it gets worse, it's going to be worth it, right? It's going to be worth their while to go through this. And as I said, with the right plan in place, it has no choice but to work because when you're removing all those crutches and you're removing all that assistance and teaching your little one how to fall asleep independently, as long as you're 100% consistent, that they have no choice but to adjust. This is the beauty of behavioral modification. It works when it's done properly and it can get you amazing results. Right. And I think that when we have that commitment and we have, you know, not just this is good for the child, this is good for our family, but also this is like you said, you know, this is a life skill we're teaching our kids. This is something that they are going to use and build on for the rest of their life. And when we have that in mind, I think it's easier for us to get through some of the screaming. Now, um, Mm -hmm. we recently became foster parents and had a three year old come stay with us. Okay. And she, uh, you know, it's like, okay, because my youngest is now 11. So it's been a little while since I've had, uh, a t- <laughs> you know, a preschooler. Right. Um, but I knew they were telling me, oh, yeah, she doesn't go to bed till nine o'clock. You have to sit with her and sing to her for an hour before she falls asleep. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, that's not, right. you know, but I knew that it was going to be an adjustment because, you know, new home, new place, a lot of changes. But you kind of have to go forward the way you're going to continue. So we just, you know, and yeah, the first night was like three hours and I started at seven, you know, three hours of me going in every two or three minutes to reassure, sing a song, you know, all that kind of back and forth. And, you know, honestly, that was the only time I had to do it. I was really surprised. That doesn't happen with all the kids. But yeah, the next night she fussed a little bit. That's fantastic. You know, I know. And I was really expecting a longer time. So I'm saying that sometimes we build these things up and it can be a shorter time period than we think. Sometimes our kids right. just really need us to go. These are the boundaries. Mama loves you. You are mm-hmm. not alone. And keep right. that kind of coming in and reassuring, but leaving to allow them to do that. And, you know, sometimes, like you said, sometimes it does get really bad. But on the flip side, Sometimes we build it up to this huge thing and we think, oh, it's going to be weeks of this. And it's, it's not. It's not. <laughs> so not. just an encouragement you know, that it doesn't ha- you know, doesn't always 100%. going to be that way. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And even, and when I talk about how this, how, you know, it could easily be a two to three week long process, we're not talking two to three weeks of torture. Right. We're talking, you know, a few days of torture, followed by things getting a little bit better, followed by things getting a little bit worse, followed by things getting a lot better. You know, it's like a two steps forward, one step back type right. of process. As the child, you know, throws mud at the wall and sees if it'll stick this time around. <laughs> and when they realize it doesn't, maybe they'll throw mud at the wall for a fourth time in a few days. And oh, it's still not sticking. Okay. All right. Maybe, maybe this new reality isn't so bad after all. And then you know what happens? They forget what life was like Mm. prior to all these new habits and new behaviors being introduced, which is you know, I think what a lot of us fail to to recognize is that, you know, you're consistent with this new routine. They're they're gonna very quickly forget what life was like. I mean, heck, when you introduce when you introduce a new baby in the picture and you have a two year old, how long do you think it takes your two year old to forget what life was like before the baby was born? Right. You know, right. Not that's, long. And that's huge. And yeah. that's a really, really big change. It doesn't it doesn't take them long. You know, they they don't have the same kind of short term memory that right. I bet us adults have, which I think we also really need to remember. Yes. Right. Exactly. Because, you know, they really don't start developing long term memory until they hit three. Um, exactly. And, exactly. Yeah. And remember, by three, it's not the same type of long term no. memory that you and I have either. Right. They're just beginning. Right. That's they may all. remember what they had for for dinner the night before. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of. When they were two, they wouldn't yeah. have remembered what they ate for dinner an hour earlier. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so we're almost out of time. Is there, is there, do you have one tip that you can give, leave our listeners with if they have a child, um, a young child who's having trouble falling asleep? Is there one thing that parents could do that would kind of help them with that 
Yes, absolutely. Implementing a consistent, relaxing bedtime routine, if you don't have one already, is really crucial to help your little one wind down and prepare for sleep. Because without it, it can be much more challenging for the child to transition from one activity to the next. So giving them that opportunity to wind down and prepare for sleep is going to set you off on the right foot. Followed by, as we've been talking all along, then teaching your little one how to fall asleep without your assistance so that they can learn how to put themselves back to sleep and stay asleep throughout the night. For any families listening who need a little bit of help in the sleep department, I actually have a free sleep guide that your listeners can download that contains my top seven sleep tips that parents can begin implementing for their little ones immediately to begin getting results. Oh, great. Well, thank you. And so listeners will have a link to that with this podcast, with her bio in the podcast, so you can download that because I think that'll be very helpful. Well, it's been a delight to talk to you today. And I just have to say that, you know, we worked really hard with our four kids because, you know, like I said, I'm tired and cranky when I don't get enough sleep. So I knew that they needed to be sleepy. (laughs) And now they're all, you know, even as teenagers, they'll put themselves to bed earlier when they're tired. You know, which is, you know, frankly, a little bit amazing. So there is, you know, you do the hard work when they're younger, when they're that, and then you'll, you'll pay those dividends off as they, as they grow because you've instilled with them how to sleep on their own and also the importance of sleep. So, yes, you know, hang in there. And we, we know that it can be a little crazy and tough, but it's well worth it. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining me today, Eva. This has been fun uh, talking about sleep. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. You've been listening to You've Got This. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and today I've been talking with Eva Klein. She's a mom of three and a certified infant and child sleep consultant and the founder of My Sleeping Baby and the Sleep Bible Program. And you can find out more about her in the bio link to this podcast. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast of You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker. Sign up to receive notification of new podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammaker.com. Until next time, remember, parenting might be hard sometimes, but don't worry, you've got this.